the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail welcomes you. Join with Senior Pastor Dr. Mike Whitson as we present Decision for Life. Welcome to First Baptist Church Indian Trail. Amen, amen, and amen. That's the way any of us are going to make it, is uh, the promises of God. Amen? <clears throat> Turn to your neighbor and say, I think you're beautiful. <laughs> Uh, I suspect my altar call will be really good today. <laughs> you know, one of the things that uh, one of the things that stood out to me all these years is the overwhelming number of Christians that struggle with whether or not they are saved. Uh, I, I think it's probably the number one malady. Uh, among Christians today is uh, having that great confidence that Jesus lives his life in them every day uh, or whether they're going to die and go to heaven or not. I, I think people just, believers really struggle with that. Now, here, here's one of the things. We, we normally come to church on any given Sunday and uh, we hear preachers talk about the responsibilities of believers. A big long list of do's and don'ts is what we would typically hear about. You got to do this, you got to do that, you got to be involved in this, do this, don't do that, don't do that. But I wonder how many of you have uh, ever heard a series on the privileges of believers. What is it that Jesus does in us and through us and with us uh, as his children? Now, I started that little series last Sunday. I promise you, as we go further into this, the deeper and deeper that it's going to become. I finished up with Hebrews 6. Uh, well, actually, uh, even before I even started the series and Hebrews just kind of announced it and then preached the first sermon, automatically there were some people that jumped and leapfrogged all the way from chapter one and they started asking me questions about chapter number six as to, you know, what about this? Do, can, can you be saved? Can you be lost? Can you be saved? Can you be lost? And I just said, well, hang on, we're going to get there. And then after chapter six, I still got lots of questions and lots of comments about uh, this idea of salvation. Now, you, you've never heard me say this, ever before, but this is a sermon today for every believer that you may want to take a note or two and take some passages of scripture and write down the reference. And you may want after today, you may want to kind of put that in the fly leaf of your Bible because it is a subject matter that every believer deals with on a consistent basis. Now, let me ask you a question. Is there anything greater than being saved? Yes. It's being saved and know that you're, being, that you're saved. Well, is there anything greater than salvation and knowing that you've been saved? Anything greater than that? Yeah. It's being saved, know that you're saved, and know that you can never lose your salvation. And so I want to talk about that this morning is the privilege of eternal security. What, the question then automatically arises as to what assures us of uh, our salvation. First of all, you ready for this? Number one, a, divi a divine decree. I can say that better than that. A divine decree assures us of our salvation. If you've been saved for five minutes, you know that salvation is a work of God. You see, we respond after God's prompting. I'll never forget, as long as I live on April the 12th, 1970, sitting there in that clean Texas church, 
the prompting of the Holy Spirit for me to be saved. I'll never forget my response to that prompting that changed my life forever and ever. Now, if you have a, a copy of the Word of God, I want you to go with me to the book of Romans and chapter number 8. And uh, we'll be looking at several passages today, so uh, keep your Bibles good and handy. But Romans chapter 8 and verse 29, the Bible says, For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. Now, when you get to studying the word of God, you discover that salvation is so much the work of God. You see here that he moves from the foreknowledge of God. He begins with the foreknowledge of God. He moves into the predestination, which moves into the calling of God. And the calling of God moves into the justification of God or the salvation of God and salvation moves into justification of God and justification of God then moves into the glorification of uh, God and he lists that out we are the product of the salvation that God has given to us and he speaks in this term of glorification as if it has already taken place but I can assure you, you and I have never seen anybody that has been glorified yet. Uh, that glorification will take place uh, after one of two things. Uh, after you die or after the rapture of the church. But here he is speaking in terms, Paul is speaking in terms as if that has already been a done deal. That it's already taken place. He was so certain. Paul was so certain that what God had in his arms, he was going to carry them all the way through, that not one person would ever fall through the cracks, that he then speaks in terms in past tense, justified, as if it had already been done. Look at chapter 11 and verse number 29 for just a second. The Bible says, for the gifts... And the calling of God are without repentance. Now what that means is that, that uh, the gift of God of salvation and the call of God to salvation can never be recalled. Uh, we see on the news an awful lot about some vegetables lately that have been recalled. Uh, we, we, we've seen a lot about some meats that have been recalled, some automobiles that have been recalled because of some defect about them. But the Bible says that once you've been saved, God has called you to himself, it is without recall. God's greatest gift of salvation is a calling that can never be revoked. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 23, the Bible says, May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, now listen to this term, may your whole spirit, May your whole body, may your whole soul be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then he says, the one calls you who is faithful will also do it. Uh, wow, what a powerful, powerful word. You have God's word on this thing that God is faithful to keep you. Now, my wife uh, has just put up a bunch of peaches and she made some salsa. She preserved some vegetables along the way here and some fruits so that they won't spoil, so that they won't go bad. And that word blameless, be kept blameless so that you won't be um, destroyed, so that you won't be spoiled, so that you won't go bad, so that you won't rot. And the Bible says that it is your good works that keeps, no, it does not. It says that it is the one who called you is the one who is faithful that is going to preserve you as well. You've got God's word on it. You say, now wait just a minute. 
you mean to tell me that once I get saved, that uh, God is going to keep me even against my own will? Now, now think with me just for a minute about that. Why wouldn't you rejoice over that fact? Why wouldn't you rejoice over the fact that once you get to squirming around, going from knuckle to knuckle in the hand of God, that even your own rebellion, even your own desires or will is not powerful enough to take you out of what God says, I am going to keep you blameless. We ought to rejoice over that, not be critical of it. Let me give you number two. You ready for this one? Say amen. I'm ready. All right, here we go. The new birth itself gives us the assurance of eternal security. In John chapter number 3, the Lord Jesus is confronting an old boy by the name of Nicodemus. And he says unto him, Nicodemus, you must be what? Born again. Now the only way into salvation is by the new birth. Now it's not a, a, just a second birth. It really is a different kind of birth birth. If you look with me there at verse number 6, uh, again in John chapter 3, uh, you'll see what I'm talking about, a different kind of birth. He says, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Now, I don't know how many of you were with me when we walked our way through 1 Peter a number of years ago, but Peter is talking to the persecuted church uh, of his day. And he says, you've been born again, not a perishable seed, but by the living, abiding word of God. Now, every one of you in this room got here the same way. The sperm of your daddy fertilized the egg of your mother, and you became alive. Now, your daddy didn't ask your opinion about it before it happened. He didn't ask your mama what uh, it, your mama didn't ask you what you thought about it. You just got here uh, by that process. Life simply uh, just happened, if you will. Let me, let me ask this question this morning. Uh, how many of you in here today are uh, 30 years old? Let me see your hand. If you're 30 years old, uh, I want you to hold your hand up. There's several up in the balcony there. I'm 30 years old down here. There's several of you that are 30 years old in the building. Did you know that at the age of 30, you begin to die? It's a scientific, physiological fact that corpuscles in your body, when you, they, they tell me from between the age of 28 and 32, that many of the corpuscles in your body begin to die. Well, by the time you're 40, they've already got your grave dug and, and, and it's there but, but you begin that process you understand your hair begins to turn gray or turn loose and uh, you, you begin to lose some of your eyesight and, and your hearing kind of goes uh, bad along the way and you're destined to die your body is going to wear out you're going to wind up in a cemetery somewhere and uh, you may have a tombstone if they thought well enough of you to put one up for you. But um, you understand, your first birth is a temporary birth. You're not here very long. You're not going to be here very long. So don't be spending a whole lot of money on yourself or the preparations of your funeral and all that kind of stuff. You're just not going to be here very long. But the Word of God says when we are born again in that second birth... We are born with imperishable seed, which really means eternal seed, a permanent seed. You understand that my salvation is kept intact by the nature of my second birth. Not my first birth, but my second birth. Now, for me to lose my salvation, God would have to reverse the process of my second birth. Uh, it, it'd be like going home and um, mashing uh, what would be delete maybe on the uh, DVR that you have at your house where you have recorded some shows. Uh, he, he would have to delete uh, his mercy. He would have to deny 
his grace and his sovereignty and his call on my life and put me back into the same state that I was in before he saved me. A powerful process. Turn over with me to 1 John. It's near the book of Revelation. And uh, <clears throat> I want you to see in chapter number 3 and verse, uh, well, look at verse 1. Chapter 3, verse 1. The Bible says, Behold, take a look at. It's on display. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed on us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not because it knew him not. That, that's what we are. We are the children of God. Prior to the second birth, we were not children of God. Now here's what the humanist would say. The humanist would say, all right, let's just all get together and because we're all part of the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man. And so he would call the Mormons and he would call the Buddhists and he would call the atheists and uh, he, he would call uh, the tree huggers and, and they'd all get together and join hands and sing Kumbaya and, and, and just really we're part of the family of God. Sorry, I'm sorry. The only way to become part of the family of God is through the second birth and to be born into the family of God. Now, now here's the deal. If I, listen, this is a powerful word here. If I could lose my salvation, then God somehow would have to unchild me. I'm not sure that that's a word or not, but it's good for the, the, the purposes now. God would have to unchild me because he's made me one of his children through the new birth. How many of you in here have children? Let me see your hands. Hold them up. Good night. I have children. Okay. Uh, do you know that you cannot unchild your child? Biologically, it's permanent. They will always be your child. Now, you may want to ride them out of the wheel. And there may come a time that you point your finger at them and say, you're 49 years old. It's time you get out of the house. You may want to do some of that stuff. But you cannot unchild your child biologically. Now, if that's true in the biological world, how much more true is it in the spiritual world that God would ever be able to go back on his word and unchild his children? Thank God we are saved forever. Now, let me give you number three. Redemption assures us we cannot lose our salvation. Say the word redemption. Redemption assures us of our salvation. Titus chapter 2, the Bible says, Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify himself unto, unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. Now when you, got, when you got saved, when you came to Jesus, when the new birth occurred, you may have felt it or you may not have felt it. You may have the knowledge that you have been redeemed or you may not have the knowledge at that point that you have been redeemed. But at that point, I want you to know, God purchased you with a price. And that price was nothing less than the rich red royal blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, in our book, in our study in Hebrews, we're going to get there. We're going to get over to chapter 9 in, in a few weeks after we get started back. But I want you to listen to what he says in verse 12. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered into once into the holy place, having obtained eternal, eternal, eternal redemption for us. He didn't say temporary redemption. He didn't say for a short time salvation and redemption. He said eternal, forever redemption. You, you understand, my salvation is not deep. Are y'all listening? My, my salvation, your salvation 
is not dependent on my faithfulness. It's not dependent on whether I have a quiet time every day. It's not dependent on whether I pray every day. It's not dependent on whether I read my Bible every day. It's not dependent on whether I tithe every week. Well, it could be, but <clears throat> I really didn't mean to say that. So, um, but, but <laughs> our salvation is not dependent on whether or not we're going uh, to be faithful. You see, if you could lose your eternal salvation, then Satan would have to come up with a price that is greater to buy you back than what Jesus purchased you with. And he purchased you with the precious blood of Jesus and there's nothing more than the blood of Jesus. So he bought you. It's impossible. Look over with me to Romans chapter 5. Uh, I want you to see a spot there with me for just a minute. Uh, Romans chapter 5. And uh, notice verse 6, if you will. He said, for when we were yet without strength, when we were lost, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I want to ask you a question. If God in his love had no trouble saving our soul, what in the world makes us think that he'll have trouble in his love keeping us saved? Now go back to verse 5 for a minute in that same chapter, 5 and 5. And hope maketh not a shame because... The love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. Now go on over to chapter 8, begin reading with me in verse 35. Who shall separate us from that kind of love? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword as it is written? For thy sake are we killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we're more than conquerors through him that loved us for I'm persuaded I'm convinced that neither death nor life you can't you, you can't you, you can't come up with something different uh, that doesn't apply to at least one of those two places nothing in death nor life nor angels there's a couple of different kinds of angels there's the angels of heaven there's the angels in hell not, not even the angels nor principalities evil nor powers, nor things present. There's nothing in the nasty now and now. And then he goes on to say, nor things to come. Anything that's going to happen in the future. Nothing now, nothing in the future. Nor height, he's talking about nothing in heaven. Nor depth, nothing in hell. Nor any other creature. In other words, if I haven't covered it all, let me just make sure that I do, Paul says. There, there's no other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Ladies and gentlemen, the Bible, God said it, the Bible records it, and I believe it, and that settles it. We are kept by the love of God. All right, let me give you number four, and I got to hurry. The seal of the Holy Spirit assures us. Now, I have all kinds of passages that I could give to you at this point, but let me just give you one. Uh, go to Ephesians chapter 1 with me. Ephesians chapter 1, and I want you to see verse 13. Ephesians 1 and verse 13. Paul says, In whom ye also trusted... After that, ye heard the word of the truth. You heard the gospel. You trusted in the gospel, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after you believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. God put an indelible mark on your life. He deposited himself in the person of the Holy Spirit in your heart.
the moment that you pray to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. And, and that deposit, listen, it's a down payment. God made a down payment to you uh, that is going to hold you secure until the day that your salvation is completed, till the day of glorification when you receive that glorified body. And that down payment is a symbol of the integrity and the commitment of God to give you the gift of salvation as evidence of that. Now, let me just say this. Hear me a minute. Everybody in the building. If you don't have the Holy Spirit, according to the Word of God, you're none of His. If you don't have that gift, if you don't have that deposit, if you don't have that down payment, if you've not been sealed by the Holy Spirit, the Bible says you're not saved. You see, the Holy Spirit is that deposit guaranteeing our inheritance which is to come. Now listen, listen, listen. I, I heard it when I was growing up. I, I, was, I was in that strain. Uh, I was taught, I was led to believe it was the most frustrating years uh, of my life when it was hammered into me. Well, yeah, you, you, you're saved, but I was going to tell you, if you mess up, you're going to lose your salvation. And you're going to have to get saved all over again. I'd go mess up. Well, you're lost. If you were really saved, you wouldn't do what you just did. So you got to get saved all over again. I heard that for years uh, in my life. And, and, and you understand, it took a long time uh, to get rid of that. I, I, I said that earlier uh, in, in, in the message. And, and I heard preachers slam their, foot, their, their, their fist down on the, the podium and say, when, when you mess up, you're driving another nail in your coffin. I heard all of that stuff. You understand, if we can lose our salvation because we mess up, then God would have to be delinquent on his payments. Because he said he sealed us. He deposited himself in us as a down payment until the day that he receives us to himself. Now let me give you number five and we'll close. The personal promise assures us. In, in 1 Corinthians, Paul is writing to the most sinful church, the most ungodly church, the most carnal church, uh, of its time. I, and, and he writes, and I want you to listen what, what Paul told them. Now, powerful word uh, in, in chapter number one and uh, in verse number eight. I want you to listen to what he said to him. Who shall also confirm you to the end that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you are called under the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Ladies and gentlemen, God is faithful and he's going to be faithful to see you according to his word here all the way through. Philippians chapter 1, Paul writing to the church at Philippi, uh, if you would look there at verse number 3, he says, I thank God upon every remembrance of, me, of you, always in prayer of mine for you, uh, making request with joy. And then in verse 6, being confident of this very thing that he which began a good work in you, isn't that good? Will perform it until he gets done. Until the day of Jesus Christ. Wow. Powerful word. I heard about an old boy. He was so ugly. I mean the boy was ugly. He'd have to sneak up on a glass of water just to get a drink. I mean he was ugly. He had to go to the photographer to have his picture made. And so he, 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 goes, he goes to the photographer, has his picture made, and the photographer then uh, gives him uh, the proofs so he could look at them. And he says, why, this doesn't do me justice. The photographer looks back at him and said, sir, you don't need justice. You need mercy. 
You, you understand that our lives were marred by sin. We were born in de depravity and, and, and conceived in sin and, and deserved death, hell, and the grave. But the mercy of God was extended toward us. He didn't give us justice. He gave us mercy. Watch this in verse 4. Uh, 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 excuse me. Uh, yeah, in verse, verse 4. Always in prayer of every mind of you making request, being confident of this very thing, that he which began a good work in you will perform it till the day of Jesus Christ. Look, look at First Peter. I, 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 want, I, I want to get over there for a minute. That, that's that's the, really the, the verse I wanted to share with you about the mercy of God. First Peter chapter 1. And in verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that fadeth not away reserved in heaven for you. You know, everything you can name down here is going to rot or rust or decay or fade away. It's, you, you ladies buy these draperies and you hang them and the sun comes in, they fade, the carpet fades. But, but, but the Bible says that you and I have an inheritance that God has already made a deposit for and that he's going to keep us until we experience that inheritance, which is Jesus, which is heaven, which is eternal life that, that is incorruptible. It, it's powerful. Now watch this in verse 5. Who are kept by the power of God. He didn't say you're kept by your good works. You're not kept by your faithfulness, but you are shielded. Hey, folks, your salvation is shielded by the power of God. And for you to lose your salvation would then be to say that there's something very delinquent about the power of God. Oh, what a passage. I want, to, I want to look at one more passage, if you would. Go to John, and then I'm going to close. John chapter 10. John chapter 10. I want you to see verse 27. John chapter 10 and verse 27. Watch this. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them. And I give unto them temporary life. It's not what he says, is it? I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Oh, my father, which gave them me is greater than all and no man is able to pluck them out of my father's hand. So, so here we are. It's a privilege to be saved. It's a privilege to know that God is never going to let us out of his hand. What a privilege. Let me, let me ask everybody in the building. Do you know that you know that you know that you know that Jesus is your Lord and is your Savior? Do you know that you know that you know that when you die you're going to go to heaven? Does Jesus live his life in you? Have you had a time in your life that you know for certain that you turned away from sin and you placed your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? Can you honestly say without a doubt, I have salvation and I cannot lose it? Oh, I'll never forget. I'll never forget. I'll never forget. I'll never forget. The day Jesus saved my soul. You know, I can honestly say, Brother Tommy, I've never, ever wanted to go back. Since Jesus saved me, I've never wanted to go back. Have I been perfect? Absolutely not. I messed up a lot of times. But I've never wanted to go back into that old way of life. God's got me now. Listen, we may wiggle around from knuckle to knuckle in the hand of God, but we're never going to fall out. He's got us right here. Do you know him? I have it in my spirit this morning. There's several people in this room 
you've never had the assurance that Jesus lives his life in you. You can honestly say, you know, I don't think I've ever been saved. I don't think I've ever known Jesus as my Lord and as my Savior. I don't think that I've ever had the assurance that when I die that I'd go to heaven. I don't think that I've ever had uh, the knowledge of the fact that I have eternal security. I, I know some of you are like that. You, you can't go back to a time in your life when God saved your soul. You need Jesus today. And today is the day that he's calling you. And by the way, if you have a desire in your heart and your life today to be saved, you didn't come up with that on your own. God gave you that desire. But it's up to you to respond. He's not going to force you to come to him. You must respond and say yes. Thank you for watching Decision for Life. Our location, life group, and program information are available online at fpcit.org. We hope you will take the opportunity to join us in person. Thank you from the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail.